Okay, let's open our Bibles. Let's get into the Word of God. Psalms 126, verses 5 to 6. Here's what the Bible says. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed. Someone say seed. But they sing as they return with the harvest. So we all know that the word of the year is reap. So today, I want to talk to you on a subject that I titled, You Will Reap. Let's pray and let's get into this word. Father in heaven, speak to us. Let us be focused and allow us in this moment to receive your word. We receive your reign, but in this moment, we receive your word. I pray wake every single young man up in this room. I pray strengthen their bones. Give them the calcium they need. Give them the strength, Lord God. I pray for every young lady in this room that you may give them the strength as well. Let us be a generation that is passionate to hear you speak into our lives. Help us understand your word. Make it plain and simple so that we could connect. Don't let these words just fly over our heads today. Let them sink deeply into our hearts. In Jesus' name, the church prays and we say, amen. Amen. So you will reap. And uh, before we actually get into all of the happiness and the jumping and the joy of us reaping, which is, you know, very like motivational and very visionary, um, I I want you to take what I'm going to teach you today as principles in regards to the word of the year. The word of the year is what's setting the tone for us. And I I know that this is going to set the tone. What I'm going to preach today sets the tone for us as a church for the entire year. But it's also going to be principles that I want to teach you that could set the tone for you personally. Okay. And so I want to teach you on three principles when it comes to sowing and reaping or just reaping period. And the first one is you have to sow to reap. You have to sow to reap. One thing that we can agree about the law is that whether if you like the law, dislike it, it's still law. Whether if you agree with the law or not, whether if you ignore it or acknowledge it, the law is still final. There's nothing that you can do when there's a law that is established because a law comes from a higher authority than you. And so sometimes no matter if we like the speed limit or not, if we cross that law and we cross that speed limit, there will be a consequence over our lives called a very expensive ticket, especially if you're young and you're only driving with your L and there's no 125 plus inside that car seat with you, you will get a very expensive ticket because you broke the law. And whether if you like the law, whether if it's a part of your preference or not, it still applies. So an example of this as well is not just the parking ticket. An example of this is the law of gravity. See, I don't have to, it doesn't matter if I believe in the law of gravity or not. It doesn't matter if I agree with it, like it, dislike it, acknowledge it or ignore it the law of gravity just is and it will apply to me whether if I want to receive that or not the law of gravity just applies so if I'm walking from this screen and I'm walking across my little stage and I come to the edge of the stage no matter what I try to do I'm going to be pulled just like the way I was right now by gravity why because it's a law it's a law whether I like it or don't like it It's a law. Whether if I acknowledge it or ignore it, it's a law. And there's this law called the law of sowing and reaping. It's a law. Whether if you like it or not. Whether if you agree with it or not. Whether if you believe in it or not. Whether if you're a Christian or an atheist. Whether if you're a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness. Whether if you're Muslim or another version of Christianity. Because there's so many of us, right? It doesn't matter. The law of sowing and reaping will apply. It applies to believers and it applies to unbelievers. There's this law and we see this law in Galatians chapter 6. And here's what Galatians chapter 6 written by the Apostle Paul says. It says this. Do not deceive yourselves. No one makes a fool of God. That's a strong introduction to introducing a law. And here comes the introduction of this law. He says, you will reap exactly what you plant. You reap what you sow. What you plant is what you'll harvest. Whatever seed that you planted, that is exactly what you're going to reap. And the Apostle Paul gives us another principle when it comes to this law. And I want you to pay attention to this principle. It's so interesting. 
it, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So I want you to catch this. I'm going to summarize everything that I just told you. In order for you to reap, you will have to sow. What you have reaped this far in your life is a product of what you've sown in your past. Everything that we live, everything that we have, everything that we've reaped thus far is exactly the byproduct or is exactly the result of what you have sown in your past years of life. What you will reap in this season of 2023 is dependent on what you will sow now. And something very important for us to know is this, that sometimes, or some things we reap, we will reap them quickly. Other things, we reap what we sow many years down the line. But the truth of the matter is that whatever you sow, that is what you will reap. And so I have an encouragement to you, and I want to read it because I don't want to butcher it. My encouragement to you is this. Many of you have sown well, and you've sown with tears, just like the psalmist said. And I'm here to declare to you, that you will reap. You will reap. You will reap a harvest of joy. You will reap a harvest of fruitfulness and laughter. Because by law, you will, say it with me, reap. By law. So what you've been through, what you've gone through, oh, God has seen your bitter tears. God has seen the moments where you were this close to quitting in life, but you still hung on. God has seen the moments where you cried battling as you're walking to church because you didn't feel like you had the strength to make it in the building. God has seen the moments that you've stepped up when you wanted to step down. God has seen the moments where you are praying and you have little faith left. You have little strength left. God has seen those moments and every tear you've shed, he counts it as a seed to sow. You have been sowing, maybe since 2020, maybe since 2021, maybe since 2022. I don't know what year hits you the hardest, but I'm going to tell you this. Because you have sown by law, this is a mandate. Remember how the law of gravity applies no matter what? Okay, I'm going to tell you this. By law, you will reap. You will reap joy. You're going to reap satisfaction. You're going to reap breakthrough in Jesus' name. It's going to come. Because it's law. So you sow to reap. Now, let's go to point two. Your seeds to sow. What are they? What are the seeds that we need to sow? How do we even sow, period? Well, I have four examples of how we can sow. And the first one is your words. Your words are seeds. Mm -hmm. and I've experienced that personally this weekend that your words are seeds that you sow and depending on the words you choose to speak that's what you'll harvest and and, and, and this is seen so clearly sometimes not with the words we speak but the words that were spoken to us as children or as kids that you've seen this example before where you will have a father or mother that talk the worst things to their children, and they will tell their children, um, oh my God, you're just so dumb, Billy. Like, why can't you just be smart? Or, you know, when parents get together and they start, like, um, bragging about their children, there's always one mom or one dad that will not brag and be like, oh yeah, my my little Billy, my little Billy, just he's just not that bright. He's not the brightest crayon in the box. And and what we don't realize is that those are words that are actually seeds that will reap a harvest. And so sometimes you will hear a wife or a husband sow seeds of words to their spouse that are not good. And the wife will complain. And one of the things that we're going to be possibly looking at is what Proverbs has to say about complaining wives. And I say this not because you're all wives. The majority of you are not. I'm saying this so that you don't become one of those. Because we, 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 I've seen this, you know, women always comparing their husbands in public or correcting their husbands in public, but in an insulting way. And they don't realize that those are seeds yeah. because words are seeds yeah. and, they're, and, and, and they're reaping a harvest that they don't like, 
but they're not willing to change and switch the seed. And this is, this is what sometimes others speak about us and, and, and we, we accept them and we come into agreement with them and then we start reaping what they speak and we wonder what's going on with my life? Why am I so dumb? It's because you received the seeds that were spoken over you. Other times it's not what others speak about us, but it's about what we speak about ourselves. Like, let me give you an example of that. It's the things like when we say, uh, I will never change. Or I'm just dumb. Like I'm slower than everybody. And I feel stupid. People treat me like I'm stupid. I act and do stupid things. And the reason why you're acting and doing stupid things is because you've planted seeds that reaped your harvest. Your words are seeds you sow. What type of words are you choosing about your life? And maybe not about your life, but how about in this season, what types of seeds are you sowing into your situation? Because that's super tricky because it's literally second nature for us. We, by default, we like negativity. By default. If we have to be positive, it has to be done through design. We have to be super intentional about being positive or in other words, church language, being faith-filled. What is it that you speak over your life? What do you speak about your body? What do you speak about? Some people go like, I'm ugly. Man, I'm just ugly and I know it. And they say it to themselves and they say it to the friends. And I have friends that I've actually heard that they don't like to look at the reflection in the mirror because they feel like they're too ugly. It reminds them of how ugly they are and they speak it over their lives. I'm ugly. Or th things like, I I'm just always going to be the fat person or I'm always going to be the skinny uh, person and I'm never going to be able to gain and put on weight or I'm never going to be able to lose weight and what you don't realize is that you are sowing so words are not just seeds but your thoughts are seeds did you know that your brain is the most powerful machine the most powerful computer on earth Apple cannot compete with God's design <laughs> your mind is so powerful and the thoughts that you decide to entertain in your mind are seeds that will reap a harvest. Do you know how a man or a woman ends up cheating on their spouse? Through seeds of thought. They have to think about it first, dude. They didn't just wake up one day and slip into adultery. Baby, I swear I was walking to work and I just slipped and stumbled into her bed. It doesn't work like that. It, th th that harvest came through seeds. And the, and the seeds were thoughts. How, how, how is our thought life? How, how, how is your thought life? Your brain is the most powerful computer that could ever, ever be built. It's so powerful, scientists have not yet known how to replicate it. It's so complex, even with the advancements of our technology. And, and what you think becomes seeds that you end up having, and if you sow them, you will reap a harvest. It could be good, or it could be bad. Another one are your actions. Your actions are seeds. The choices you choose to the way that you choose to behave, the way that you choose to do things, those are seeds. And Paul is saying, hey, what you sow is what you're going to reap. So that makes me wonder, how many people come to church and they come with a bad attitude? They show up late and they're slouching on their chair and they're rolling their eyes and they're zoning the word of God out. And, and they're just always so groggy, so rude. They come late, they leave early, they come with an attitude and they're expecting to reap blessing. And, and, and maybe you're having a real battle. Maybe you are, but maybe it's not just a battle. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just seed. Like I hear so many young people go like, I don't know if I believe in God. I don't know if I believe in church. I don't know if I believe in faith anymore. I just don't know. Well, I'll tell you, if you change your seed, you'll switch your harvest. You'll reap something different. Because if I come to church expectant, if I come to church sitting on my chair and I'm at the edge of my chair leaning in, if I come in with a mindset of faith, if I'm coming here with like, I need God, and I'm coming in with an attitude of openness, and I'm coming in with a positive attitude of faith that says, I know that God's going to speak to me somewhere, somehow, then you're going to reap a totally different experience when you sit in church at the 3 p.m. 
But if you're coming all negative, you're coming all like doubtful, you're coming all like bothered, pissed off, maybe sleepy, draggy, like that. Of course you're not going to reap what you're supposed to. So many people want to switch their harvest, but they're not willing to switch their seed. But I saved the best seed for last, which is possibly the most touching. And that is not your words, not your thoughts, not your actions, but yourself. Your seed. And I take this principle from what Jesus spoke in the gospel of John chapter 12, verse 24. And Jesus said this, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. What is Jesus trying to say here? What, what, why is he talking about kernel and seed and dying seeds? You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about himself. He's saying, my life is a seed. And if I don't die on that cross, it'll remain a seed. But if I die on that cross, there will be many seeds. Salvation. So Jesus is saying, if, 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 if I don't see my life as a seed, and I don't understand that I have to die, Jesus is talking about his death here. He said, if, if I don't die, many people will not be saved. I mean, can you imagine how tr tremendous that is? That Jesus left everything, and his purpose was not to come and establish a kingdom here on earth. He didn't come to be served. He didn't come to be a celebrity. He didn't come for the Instagram followers. He didn't come for fame. He didn't come for any of that. Jesus came for one thing. To die. Would you take that vacation and holiday trip? You're going to travel from like your comfort to a place where they're not going to receive you. Instead, they're going to reject you. And that's not even the worst part. They're going to kill you. That's what Jesus essentially did. He, he took a trip from perfection to imperfection. From, from, from what is the best to what is mediocre. And he comes here, even though he knew he was going to be rejected, he comes here to die. And, and his purpose is, because if I don't, then they can't live. And so I say this point, and I share this point, um, because I want you to understand that even though Jesus was suffering and going to go through pain, he was still in God's will. You want to know why? Because he was planted. He was planted in, 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 in God and in his will. And I shared this point to, to you today because some of you are in this season. And I want this point to serve you as a reminder that even though you may be in a tough season, you are on the right track. You're on the right path. You're in the right place. And I say this because sometimes when we're in those tough seasons of suffering, even though they are appointed by God's will, not that he is the author of suffering, but he has permitted it. He's going to make you stronger. Yeah. But even though it is something that he permits in our lives, we sometimes lose sight that it could still be God's will. And we start going like, where is God? And why did he allow this? And a question that I want you to think about if you're in a tough season is this. That when you're in those tough seasons and God allowed it to happen to Jesus, one of the questions that we need to ask ourselves is this. Then why not me? If, if Jesus went through the worst thing ever, in, even though he was planted in the will of God, then why not me? Who am I not to? But every tough season, and every season of confusion, or of darkness, or of pain, I'm just here to tell you, it has an end date. It has an expiry date on it, and it will come to, a, it will come to an end. God's just using it to strengthen your muscles just a little bit. I know you don't get it. I know you don't understand it. I know that you want it to end now. Someone say, amen, end it now, Lord. Yeah, 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 but, but, but God is using it. You know, I heard that if there's a butterfly, well, not a butterfly, when it's a, what do you call it when it's a, yeah, yeah, in a cocoon. There you go, yeah, yeah. 
When, 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 a, when, a, when, a, uh, uh, when a caterpillar is in a cocoon and it's about to uh, break off from its cocoon to fly, I heard that if you assist it in breaking its cocoon, it does not develop the strength that it needs in order to fly. So if you assist it, you kill its flight. You know what I'm here to tell you? That if you're going through it and it's tough and it's not easy and you feel like you don't have the strength, Here's what I'm trying to tell you. God is just developing you because you are about to take flight. You're about to soar. You're about to reach what God has destined you for. I know you're breaking out of the cocoon. I know that it feels impossible. I know that you want God to come and help you. But let me tell you, if God stops it, you won't have the strength to fly. And you were not meant to stay at the level that you're in. You're meant for higher levels. So, so if, 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 if Jesus went through it, we can too. We can too. Here's what Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, which is the same chapter that we started with. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right, someone say time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. You will reap it. You will reap it. By law, have faith. Have faith, don't doubt. You will reap it. I don't know when, but you will reap it. God has his perfect timing. But just at the right time, if we don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't. Don't. Hang on. Take it one day at a time. Feed your mind with God's word. Get around people that will speak faith into you. Get around people like that will shake you up a little bit sometimes. Be like, hey, 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 snap out of it. This is not your destiny. This is temporary, not permanent. Get around people that will remind you. Pierce through, don't give up. Pierce through, don't give up. Hang on, because just at the right time, you will reap a blessing. You will reap not just a blessing. You will reap a harvest of blessing. Does somebody here believe that? Here's the third principle. Your faith to reap. Here's what I need you to understand. Planting and burying look the same. But they're not. One is for death. One is for life. Planting and burying look the same. But they are not. One is for death. One is for life. So we need to be planted in Christ and in his church. I'm going to say amen. Amen. We need to be planted in order to look at life through the lens of faith. Because you will reap. You will reap. And you will reap because you're planted. You're not buried. You are planted. You may not see how it all works out. But you believe and know. That it will. You may not understand how it's all going to pan out. You may not see how things are going to work out. But you just need to believe in you that it will. Someone say it will. will. And there's this principle of not knowing when it comes to seed that Jesus demonstrates as he depicts what the kingdom of God is like. And he shares this in Matthew or Mark chapter 4 verses 26 to 28. Jesus also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day. Someone say night and day. day. You know what this is a reference to? This is called the reference of time. Mm. The time, night and day. Mm. Every night I go to sleep. Every day I wake up. Every night I go to sleep again. Every day I wake up and the freaking problem's not gone. And we're going like, God, where are you? And we're going like, when is this going to end? And when can I have relief? And when is this going to stop? And when, when am I going to have the breakthrough? When am I going to have the miracle? Night and day. Someone say night and day. Night this, is a, this is a reference of time. And, and, and what you need to understand is that your time is not God's time. And God has a perfect time. And his timing is perfect. And he knows exactly when your breakthrough should come. And, and, and we're down here going like, uh, any minute now... <laughs> 
Uh, uh, you know, I feel like you're taking a little too long. I think I understood the lessons. I, I think I get what you're trying to teach me. I think I, I think I got it, God. And God's like, mm, no, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> what you're looking for is relief, but you don't have revelation. And your God's timing, God's timing is not designed for your relief. God's timing is designed for revelation. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how, all by itself, someone say the soil, soil. produces grain. Pastor Stephen Furtick said this. I think it was in regards to this passage. You have to let the dirt do its work. The, the messiness. What's, what's dirty? What, what, what's, what, what is not clean? It may have manure to fertilize the soil and the seed. You know what manure is? It's poo. And, and you know that manure stinks. And you can smell it when they come, right? And they put it around. You know, like if you live in a complex or a co-op or, and they bring manure to fertilize the soil and the seed and it stinks and sometimes it feels like God is pouring out manure because life stinks. It's dirty, it's, it's messy, it's ugly, it's, it's not pleasant. But it's, it's in those moments where life gets a little bit complicated and confusing and dark and horrible. Those are the moments where we have to, even though we don't understand, we have to allow the dirt to do its work. If we could hear the seed while it's being planted, I think we would hear the seed Cry out, it's dark in here. I think, I think, I think, I think that the seed, seed is one of the many things that God created so that I could be birthed to die in order for it to give fruit. And I think that if we could hear the seed cry out while it's being planted, not buried, planted. Planted is for life, buried is for death. If we could hear the seed cry out in agony while it's being planted, we would hear it say, it feels lonely in here. It feels lonely in here. It's dark all around. I think that if we could hear the seed, we would hear the seed cry out saying, there's a lot of pressure down here. Do you know why we plant seeds? One is because the soil, when it covers it, it adds pressure to the seed. Because without the pressure, the seed can't crack. And it's when it cracks that it can bear fruit. So if the seed don't crack, there's no food. There's no fruitfulness. And I think that's where so many of us are at in life. We're in the stages where we've been planted, not buried. It feels dark, feels lonely, and we're being cracked because the pressure's strong. And while it feels like death, God is saying, but I'm bringing life. God's kingdom's really upside down to what the world is like. God says, if you want to be great, you got to become the least. If you want to be first, you got to become last. If you want to live, you have to die. kingdom of God feels so upside down. You're a seed. That is what you are. Your life is a seed. And if you're going through it, and you're going through something difficult, I'm just here to tell you, you are being planted. And not only that, but you're being planted because you will reap. So let the dirt do its work. Here's my conclusion. 
To sow comes from the heart. To reap comes from God. To sow comes from the heart. To reap comes from God. Sowing is a heart thing. And I want to demonstrate that through a story. Two stories, actually. So story time with Pastor Marlon. Here we go. <laughs> There's this pastor that got invited to preach at a mega church. And they have multiple services in their mega church. So he's in the green room of... Uh, the church in between services and as he's resting he sees um, one of the little kids of a top leader in the church come into the green room with a clear plastic bag that had a hundred candies in it or so a hundred candies or so in this little plastic bag and so the pastor gets up from his sofa as he's resting in between services and goes to little Timmy I don't remember his name but I think it was Timmy we'll call him Timmy and says, hi, little Timmy, can I have a candy, please? And Timmy says, no. And not only did he say no, but he grabbed the bag and put it behind him so the pastor couldn't see the candy no more. <laughs> what a little. <laughs> now, the pastor did not back down, and the pastor said, Timmy, because he knew the leader and he knew the family, he said, Timmy, will you please give me a candy? And Timmy shook his head with the bag behind him still saying, no, no, but like, like almost like shocked that he was asked to share and to sew. And the mother is in the green room, but in the opposite corner watching this and she's feeling embarrassed. And the pastor still does not back down. And as a matter of fact, took a step closer to little Timmy and said, Timmy, please give me a candy. And Timmy is not backing down either and says, no. But then his mom gets up and adds a little bit of pressure. And so the pastor steps forward again and says, Timmy, give me a candy, please. So Timmy takes the bag out now that he feels the pressure from the pastor not backing down and his mama just watching him around the corner. And he starts putting in his hand and he puts his hand in the bag and starts going like this. And the pastor starts assuming that he's looking for the smallest candy to share. So he takes out a small candy, and little Timmy, you know what this kid does? He breaks it and starts looking for the smallest piece of the candy to sew into the pastor's hand. And the mom says, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed that little Timmy did not, I'm so sorry, you know, we're still trying to teach him how to share. And this is what I'm trying to tell you, that sewing is a hard thing. Because here's the truth. We all have a little plastic bag. Mm. Come on. Come on. The thing with us is that we're not holding candy inside. We hold things like time. And sometimes God is looking down at you and he's saying, Hey, little Timmy, would you give me some more of your time? And here's what we do. Like little Timmy, we grab the bag and we put it behind us and we say, Nope. No, you can have my Sunday. For an hour and 45. But I don't know if you can have my Wednesday to come pray at 7. And, and we hold the bag and we hold the bag and we, and we, we sort of say no. And then God sometimes comes in Sunday after Sunday through me. I don't know why he uses me for this. And reminds you that you need to come pray on Wednesday. And, and reminds you that you need to give some time for your city group so that you can carry each other's burdens and follow the law of Christ. And, and so we are pressured sometimes because we hear it over and over and over and over and over again. And, and instead of having a mother, you see a city group leader that's playing that role in your life. So now you got the pastor and your city group leader and you have God. And so here's what we do. God is saying, I need more of your time. And so we take the plastic bag out and we start looking. <laughs> to, to slot in just a little bit of time. Just, just, just a little bit. I'll, I'll show up at the end of city group when everybody eats. I'll show up at the beginning of prayer and then I'm going to leave early just so that they don't say anything. See, sewing, it's a hard thing. Sometimes God is not asking you for time and you're not holding time in your bag. Sometimes God is asking you for your tithe and your offerings. You all know that we don't talk a lot about money in this church. We have one series a year about finances. 
And that's on purpose so that people don't come in here during the entire year going like, they only want our money in our church. We don't want your money. We don't want your money. You are not our provider. God is. Here. Yeah. But why do we talk about it? Because it's one of the biggest areas of our lives and it's one of the things that actually competes with God in your heart. You, you remember what Jesus said, right? You cannot serve both God and money. You notice how Jesus didn't even say you can't serve both God and the devil? He said you can't serve God and money. Why? Because money sometimes holds a bigger spot in our hearts than the devil does. And so we're holding our bag. And, and, and in there we have our monthly income. And God's like, hey, will you give me 10% and keep the 90 so I can bless your 90? We're like, no. <laughs> you can have my Sundays. You can have my midweek. You can have my prayer. And I'll even come on Friday to pray twice. But you can't touch my money. I love you, Lord. Sure you do. <laughs> and we're like little Timmy because, because sewing is a hard thing. A little delayed. Sewing is a hard thing. Sometimes it's not finances. Sometimes it's not time. Sometimes what you're holding inside your bag are bad friendships. And, and, and you're running in the green room of God's proverbial green room happy. <laughs> Shaking your little bag of bad friendships. Oh my God, I love you all. Boop. And you're excited about your friendships. And you don't realize that those friendships are something that God has been asking from you since 2020. You don't realize that your bad friendships are bad influence that are corrupting your good character. And so you're pressured and you put your hand in the bag of bad friendships, and you're trying to pick which one's the easiest to cut out. <laughs> and you're like, God, you can have Martha. <laughs> but I'm going to keep Joe, Bill, and Bob. So here, here, here's, 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 here's the big question. Um, what is God asking you to sew that is in your little plastic bag? Sewing is a hard thing. What's your posture like? Like, please don't let sewing is a hard thing. Just become words that you hear. Like, tune in and synchronize with your spirit what that actually means. Do you have a, do you have a surrendered heart? Do, do you have a sensitive heart to the voice of God? Do you have a soft heart? Do you have a genuine heart? Do you have a heart that is actually surrendered and bowing down to the will of your God? Or are you planted in the will of God, even if that means pain? Are you planted? Because if you're not planted in a moment of pain and suffering, you're going to ditch. You're going to walk out. And even walking out, reaps a harvest. Second story that I want to give you. There's this pastor that went and got invited to, um, he got invited to preach at a leadership conference in Africa, 10,000 in attendance, huge arena, huge, huge. And uh, in between his sessions of preaching, in between the days of the conference, he went out to a market, a local market. And he's out in a local market in Africa and this, this lady comes to meet him and she knew him because he had been in a room with 10,000 people preaching up on stage and so more people knew him than he knew people. She comes up to him and grabs his hand and says, God bless you, Pastor. Just grabs it in public, in a market. You know what those markets are. It's like the night market in Richmond. Kind of like that. That's the Bible. And she said, Pastor, have you bought a gift for your wife and your daughter yet? And the pastor's like, no, I just literally just got here right now. I haven't had the chance and I haven't had the time. And she said, okay, please come. Follow me. Come to my booth. And this lady's an, a lady in her mid-40s, maybe 50s. She's dirty, has a ruggedy dress, holes all over her clothes. She has missing teeth. And the few teeth that she does have, they're rotting. She's not well kept. She is poor. And she comes to this booth, brings this pastor to the booth. And starts looking around her booth and she starts opening some boxes and she starts shuffling things and she finds what she's looking for. And what she was looking for were two necklaces. And she said, Pastor, I want to give you these two necklaces 
so that you can give one to your daughter as a gift and one to your wife. And this pastor gets impacted in in that moment. He gets impacted to see the condition of her life, yet the generosity of her heart. She's a sower. And so as they're about to make an exchange, he carried $300 bills. He carried three $100 bills. In total, $300. Separately, $100. Three of those. (laughs) Just to make it clear. And he grabs one and rolls it up in his hand so that as he makes the exchange, he takes her gift and he shakes her hand with the other and gives her the $100 bills. And she takes the $100 bills, unrolls it, looks at it, and says, no, 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 no. I cannot accept this. Don't you know that poor people like to give as well? And in that moment, he tears up and starts crying, just wanted to keep his composure, but he could not. To see the level of generosity. And he says, she said, I don't want you to take my blessing of reaping when I'm sowing. If I take your $100 bills, you take my harvest. Sowing is a hard thing. It's a hard thing. So I want us to read the passage fully that we started with in Galatians chapter 6. It says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So here's my question for you today, and this is what I end with. Where? Where are you going to sow to reap this year? Mm 